whenever I'm talking to someone about my book or about the subject, maybe for the first time or something like that, there are some go-to games that I use. There's one particular one which I had used for a lot of the articles and book promo stuff, which is on Skellige with the mountains in the background and there's multiple fields and loads of colourful plants and it's between Boxholm and Firsdal. And you can pretty much go across, you know, in between any of those two towns and up, up and down the, the valley where the river runs and the vistas is incredible. But then it's, it's what The Witcher 3 does with that is it extends it. It's not just a vista, it extends it with, I don't know, even Geralt's chatting about the wind, um, <laughs> the, 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 the wildlife you can see moving around and making noises. So that one was, is a particularly important one for me because that's one of the first ones that I really took on board and, and analyzed and realized what modern game de devs are doing and can do. My friend Rob is writing a book and I'm very excited about it because it's about the exact sort of niche video game design topic that I usually dive into for these videos. You see, before Rob was the deputy editor of Tech Radar Gaming, before he covered hardware for a living like I do, Rob was an award-winning landscape designer. And so for his book, he is combining his two loves and writing all about the power of video game landscapes. And the book is called Genius Loci. As someone with so much expertise about gardens and garden design, you must have thoughts on like how overall, how accurate games can be at making gardens and landscapes. Overall, do you find yourself going, my God, that's a really good landscape, or that's a really accurate landscape, or do you find yourself going, this is just shit? <laughs> um, no, I, I think I think I have too much appreciation for the sort of art of game dev anyway to, to say that it's just shit. But I, I might I might be able to go, that's interesting. That's you know things that would be jarring to me may not be jarring to most or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely see that. A good one for that is um is like plant selection because um I've got I've got plenty of notes about where it's clearly been thought of and uh, the Witch Three is another good one where you have the right plants. Those plants that you can interact with, i.e. the ones that they give names to, right. um, particularly, um, are found in the right place. Like hellebores found at the edges of woodlands and they're growing the right crops That's in amazing. that climate. I've um, never actually thought about that before. They're arranging them in the right way in lines or whatever, on, or, on, or seemingly, um, as much as you can tell, sort of, you know, on the south side for vines and north side for uh, olives and things like that. But, but equally, you, you get one like in Skyrim, which is just winter. You're getting Mediterranean herby plants like lavender and things like that, and it's like, <laughs> I know why you've put that there. That is, that's just, it's just wrong. Yeah. But equally, they're never enough to make it too jarring in terms of like, oh, this is terrible. I can't interact with this bit anymore. <laughs> it makes me, it makes me annoyed in that sense. Yeah. Um, but equally, that's the general trend, right? Yeah. The general trend is devs are very good garden designers, landscape designers, um, getting there with horticultural too. So yeah, so I don't think there's any that are really, really that bad. We might get the odd jarring, jarring yeah. bit. Lots of video games use wide open landscapes, right? And I think depending on how they do it or how good the game is, they either get criticized for it or they get praised for, for creating atmosphere. Uh, do you have any examples of games that are either really good at using open space or are terrible at using open space? That is a really good question because um, I remember um, at university would also on one hand get told like you know use the space to to stimulate or show your design or or show off your skills in design or tie you know put something there to tie it into your overarching theory or something and then at other times I, you're, you're told don't be afraid of open space as well. <laughs> um, I was thinking about the Shadow of the Colossus recently by coincidence. I think some of the music made it onto Radio 3 or something. And my dad even said, is this one you've played or whatever? And I sent him some pictures. Because I think, yes, the openness of that one is, is a good example of that, where it's done well, because it builds a sense of place that ties into what you are doing the course of the game and the place building and the fact that it gives you time to to 
think and um, reflect on what's coming up and what's been gone. And and like I quite I described it as sort of quite a mournful landscape because it fits in with that sort of slightly mournful vibe, if you like, of of the game itself. If the Shadow of the Colossus's landscape was filled with, you know, stuff, art, uh, temples, articles to collect, things like that, I think it would feel a bit different and weird yeah. and, and a bit out of place. A question I also had noted down was about how landscape can feed into storytelling. You know, like I, I, Dishonored is a good one for, for me in terms of they use the landscape. It's not, it's not always gardens, it's not always, you know, vistas or open spaces. It's often a landscape in terms of this is a town and you can see the impact of a plague. You can tie that into The Last of Us as well with this is the sign of the apocalypse because nature is reclaiming what was humanities. Yeah, I think that's great. I, that's one of my, that's basically one of my favorite things as well, relating um, how what game devs are doing with the with landscapes, gardens, environment design, and how it relates directly into stories and characters. I really like that. I think The Last of Us is a particularly good good example, not necessarily from the right analysis that you just mentioned, but you could break it down even further and look at how they use the foreshadowing. You know, I think there's it's quite a striking image with Joel has his accident and falls on dead mm-hmm. leaves. And it's quite a, quite a good image of of what's to come and the whole chapter starts off in a bucketing down rain which is a bit of like pathetic fallacy which is not what novelists used to do but i also agree with you on the dishonored one in terms of sort of it tells the story of the place and builds that up like i think the, the boil manor is quite a good one because it's set in that city of plague and everyone else is struggling but the you know the posh people with the money have still got enough to have a party and yeah. you can look in on that and they've built their houses and, and gardens accordingly as well um, they've, they've got a show. dueling space in their garden as well. They've, I know, but, but it's, it's, it's also designed where like the neighbouring houses who are not quite as well off can can see into the garden a bit and get yeah. jealous, but they're never invited because there's a high gate and things like that. Yeah. Um, it will sometimes sometimes feel a bit crowbar in some sort of after the fact, but actually, it's um, maybe it's unintentional, maybe it is intentional. Who knows? But it's um, there's a lot going on about that. And I think it's sort of a very underrated element of game environment design for sure. And like, and like even just sort of the way landscapes are designed to reveal to you, like the next bit of the story or what this game's about. Like, you know, the classic Bethesda Skyrim Oblivion reveal at the beginning where you're confined uh, early on and then you're sort of thrust out into the landscape at the end of the intro, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's brilliant. That's one of my favorite themes. I don't think it's a coincidence that 2023 was such a terrible year for game devs being laid off. And at the same time, 2023 was also the year that generative AI became such a mainstream entity. Procedural generation is used in more and more games these days to create environments and make game devs' jobs easier. But is one better than the other? Rob seems to have a horse in that race. I think the handcrafted ones will always be better. I'm going to be as bold as saying that because that because of that they've been handcrafted, thought of by by people who are designers. If they're not landscape designers, so there's you know every bit of it has had a human decision behind it uh, with intent, um, and it relates to a whole other bunch of decisions and design strategies and themes and what they're trying to create more broadly. But in that in that same respect, if if that is what is informing the procedurally generated ones, then the procedurally generated ones should be. This is like this is the whole AI question, isn't it? <laughs> um, um, they should be great, right? No Man's Sky got a bit of flack about that when it's certainly in its early early days. So maybe there's something going on. again. I repeat, I'm not a game dev. Maybe there's some disconnect between that, or maybe there's some di- you know maybe the the approaches to developing those games though or those game worlds it's, are so divorced from one another that what I've just said can't happen. You know, you don't you can't have yeah. handcrafted landscapes and environments feeding the air. It's just a different, you know, different different realm. And and even if like a large open world that's that's not procedurally generated like a horizon or a or a red dead, even if in those like every tree hasn't necessarily been planted by a person. 
the overarching principle, design principles and decisions taken to make those will always have that human touch. It will be informed by a lot of theory and research, I'd like to think, uh, rather than something that's just, well, I suppose I suppose it's a kind of AI, isn't it? But, um, mm. Rather than something that is procedurally generated that's drawing from a pool of something. Another example you just brought to my mind there is Red Dead 2, um, which you did a recent book update about. Because I think you were you were talking about rivers and stuff in that book update. Yep. Um, and it kind of got me thinking. It's it's interesting to me how nature is used in game design and game and sort of level design, I suppose. Um, because it's, they, they focus on making realistic gameplay, realistic landscapes are a part of that. So you bring in weather, you bring in wildlife, food chains, horse, balls, like there's there's so much there. Um, but for, for me, that is one of the games that gets nature so right that it sort of makes you appreciate your own environment a little bit more. Do, do you think video game landscapes sort of have a role to play in helping people appreciate the environment around them and getting unplugged from technology and going out and actually, you know, touching grass as the meme nowadays. <laughs> um, I don't, uh, not the touching grass bit, but the bit just before that in terms of like encouraging people to go out. I don't yeah. know about that, but I think one big impact it does and will have, it, it, it will take you to places that you cannot go. Yeah. Um, and it, it will show you garden designs that you'll not really have seen before ever. It will take you to landscapes which are familiar or full of familiar elements, but are actually, you know, fictitious. So you'll never be able to go there. So that that's one element of it. But equally, it will. Uh, the more you do of that, and maybe it's what I've been doing with some of the book updates as well. But um, the more you go through games and soak up all their wonderful atmospheres and environments, the more you start to see that when you do go out and you do draw the draw the parallels and you learn to appreciate um i think both in a way because you go but that's incredible that that actually exists like this oh, i remember that from a sort of you know fantasy game like dragon age or something and i could see something like it in the real world but also then you turn it back and you go wow those guys actually are, are landscape designers in a way and may have managed to recreate this or design that or included these plants which i know are now familiar from where i live so it's tough to say think it will you know they'll encourage folks to go out maybe but i think when they do they'll they'll draw parallels um as you do with reading and any other sort of media and films and whatnot video game literature is still fairly niche so it's no real surprise that rob's book is a crowdfunded project now i never really seek out money for myself for doing these videos but if you have enjoyed what rob has to say about this topic and if you want to hear more you could be really helping him out it being a crowdfund adventure means i need all the support i can get in terms to make it happen um, it doesn't happen until i get 100 percent funding um, so i'm looking for people to go to unbound.com slash books slash genius loci um, or find me on Twitter, if anyone still uses that anymore, it's at Rob Dwyer or LinkedIn or any any of the usual places, um, and and back the book and share it around. You commit to helping it become a reality, but there's lots of different ways um, you'll get rewarded for your backing, basically, um, all the way from an ebook or a hardback cover um, to having a chat with me about garden design or helping you out with a, a project or anything. So there are many levels. Um, I can't remember which one you've done, Dunk. Um, I want to say it's the hardback. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. But I'm getting that's, that's, the chat for free. <laughs> yeah, this is true. I should charge you for this. Um. <laughs> so that's all for this video. I hope you've enjoyed this slightly different look at a very niche video game design topic. Thank you so much for watching. Hit the subscribe button and the bell icon if you'd like to see more. And tune in next time.